Cock and Bull Podcast, I tell history things to my big boy, Nathan. Nathan, how you doing? I like that I'm big boy, Nathan. Man, I racked my brain for something new to say, and I think I nailed it. I think, yeah, I think we came out of the guns firing there. That was, uh, that was interesting. Should we, should we alert the people that, that this should be the last one where I possibly sound like hot garbage because I, I will be upgrading my recording studio, AKA my 2015 Chevy Malibu LS cockpit, uh, with, with actual recording stuff as opposed to just, just the crappy stuff I have now. So we're going to, we're going to be sticking with the same studio. We're still going to be in the Chevy Malibu, but just the, the tech inside of it's going to. Increase. I don't. I, I mean, the Chevy Malibu is not the issue. It's a fine American-made vehicle, and it, the acoustics are fantastic. Uh, Chevy, please. I, I I will leave my email at the end of the podcast. You are welcome to send us uh, we any need kind sponsors, of advertising definitely. check. All of it. All of it. I will. I will sell my soul for anything. At this point, basically, the neo Nazis could probably give me money, and I would. I would. I would be okay with it. Well, Nathan, wanting to breeze past this this uncomfortable topic, on August fourteenth, eighteen sixty six. Henry Herbert Goddard was born in East Vassalboro, Maine, going back to the good old USA, where Chevy cars Woo! were made. Yeah. To his parents, Henry and Sarah Goddard. So we got a bit of a hey! father Henry and a son Henry. You can relate. That's, my, that's also my child and my wife's name, so this is weirdly incestuous for me now. Oh, God. That, well, I didn't, I didn't realize that was a Sarah. All right. He was born... The, you didn't realize that was a Sarah. You said the name Sarah, and it never clicked? Mm, I, I mean, I don't... I don't want to talk about it. He was born the fifth of six children, though two of his sisters had died in infancy because the 1800s were, were, were best described as pretty not cool for infant mortality. Were they stolen by the Indians? Uh, I, you know, as far as I know, uh, two of them died from illness. Uh, others could have been taken by the Indians. I just, it wasn't documented. Uh, frankly, because okay, who has time? Enough. Every other kid's getting stolen every other week. You know, you can't. You can't waste precious I'll, pen and ink on I'll it. I'll just assume. I'll just assume the consumption got the rest of them. That's a fair. That's a fair guess. His father was gored by a bull when Henry was a small boy. <laughs> what the fuck? Pardon? And the injuries. This is in Maine, right? He's not a Spaniard. He's not like taunting them. Is, it, is that a thing that happens regularly in Maine? <laughs> no, you're no. I mean, you're right. He's in Maine. Uh, I'm not sure how abnormal that is. They might. They might have just had a a bull problem. I just I hear gored by bull and I think of bullfighter. And not, like, guy in Maine. Well, that's definitely, of all of the, the death by bull goring, it's normally matadors or dumbasses who run in the street with bulls. Uh, but, I mean, this could have been, like, a, a weird mix of both. Maybe he was, you know, just downtown and a rogue bull kind of jumped him from an alleyway. I don't know. Well, this has started well. The injuries festered until the boy was nine years old. Uh, and then his father, much like 44% of babies in 1866, died. Uh, this was also not a great time for Henry's dad mortality rates. Now, age nine, Henry was eventually without a place to stay. And you might be asking, why didn't his mom want him? Well, Nathan, that, this poor- That is a valid question. This poor woman had at least three other kids to take care of, and we all know it's much easier just to kick your youngest to the street than, I, I don't know, like, help him cope with losing a dad. I mean, can you do that? Can you just, like, cut a couple loose once you've got a solid stable? Like, is this like Pokemon where, like, what, like I, I catch everything early on, but then it's like, I don't need 14 Pidgeys. Like, I'm going to cut a couple of these loose. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, okay. And I would assume, much like your Pidgeys, uh, he moved to his sister's home, uh, one of the older ones who was now happily married. It was about two years uh, before she said, yeah, I don't want you either. And then she sent him to Oak Grove Seminary, uh, which was a boarding school just outside of town. I'm starting to think it might be Henry. It might just be his, he might have been a shit kid. Get abandoned once, shame on you. Get abandoned twice, shame on me. By 21, he had received his bachelor's from Harvard College, Pennsylvania. Wait, uh, this wait, is 1877 wait. now. Is that, but that's, that's not the Harvard. That's like Ohio University, like trying to make people think it's Ohio State University when it's really not. Harvard University of Pennsylvania is not the Harvard that we think of, right? <laughs> oh shit, I, I slipped up. It's Haverford College. Oh, that's not even oh. close to the same thing. Okay, they look vaguely similar on my sheet. Yeah, I can see that, but, but yeah, okay. So at age 21, he got his bachelor's. Now that sounds fairly impressive as someone that, that, that dicked around for a couple of years in college, but like back then, weren't people getting college degrees at like 13? Like, like it was no big deal. Oh yeah. Like weren't they yeah, all yeah. just a Me bunch of I, fucking I, Doogie Howsers? Is this guy retarded? I'm pretty sure uh, our finger banging hypnotist Mesmer had it when he was like 13. Oh and then yeah. He became a doctor by the time he was 15, something like that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm quite concerned. I'm quite concerned that this guy may not, uh, he may not only be a shitty kid, he may not be smart. <laughs> by age 23, 
he had his master's in mathematics, this is 1889, and then by age 33, he had his PhD in psychology. Okay, well, now, that's, that's kind of shitting on my, he might be a, you know, a, a stupid person idea. <laughs> well, he's 33, you know, he's definitely taking his sweet-ass time with it. So he got that from Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's 1899 now. This almost would be almost the place, at the turn of the century. This would be the place where we would do a really great Boston accent if we weren't awful at those. Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't know. If playing D&D has taught me anything, I have about three voices. One yes. of them is me, but higher. Another mm-hmm. one is uh, my standard goblin voice, which just sounds like a terrible Joe Pesci. No, yeah, no, uh, your goblin is just stereotypical Long Island gangster. Yeah, which I could bust that out, but I, I also ah, keep that I in the tr- quiver. Keep that in the quiver. Yeah. Oh, save it for the big bucks. Yeah, don't. All right. Yeah, come on now. If you've heard some, uh, no, oh, hold on. That's a that's a wrong paragraph. That's a paragraph that's just meant for the written version. Ah. I don't know if people know this. There's a there's a written version of this podcast. It's on uh, cockandbullblog.wordpress.org.com. If you wait, ca- wait, if you like many, the podcast, what, how, many, but, how many dots did that, that? I feel like was that a dot org dot com? Like how many how many extras did you put in the I'm there? just look, Nathan. I'm just really rolling over words today. You it's really are. Don't worry. It's only dot com. I am, however, buying cockandbullblog.wordpress.org.com. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so yeah, we need that redirect. But yeah, if you enjoy the podcast, but you just wish it didn't have Nathan, you can just go ahead and read it there. Uh, it's honestly, you're just getting less material. But yeah, if you like hate listening to things. I mean, you Go say less material, that. but obviously there's a paragraph in here that we're not going to read. So if you want the bonus bonus footage, you know, go to page 12 and, and read that. Goddard had hopped around a handful of instructing gigs before he finished his doctorate. He taught Latin, coached football, and he even became the principal of his own boarding school from 1891 to 1896. Which, that's kind of fun. He's like coming full circle. Yeah. Like, yeah, just like you children, I my parents didn't want me either. I was also a shithead. Let me educate you. By the way, when I say he coached football, that's kind of an understatement because Goddard was the first uh, head coach of the Trojans for South Carolina. Uh, He was also, by the way, their only undefeated coach, which that's a super cool achievement if you ignore that he was only coached for one season. I was about to say, well, one season. Okay, that's better than like, I thought you were going to say he coached for like one game and then was like, I'm going out on top. (laughs) I'm coming out ahead. (laughs) While he was studying for his PhD in psychology, Goddard found a fascination with intelligence. In 1906, when he finished his professorship at the State Normal School in Westchester, Pennsylvania, Goddard went to New Jersey's Vineland Training School for feeble-minded girls. <laughs> there, <laughs> don't you damn like that it. that one just wears it on the sleeve? God damn We know what we're about. I mean, at least they're upfront about it, but come on. This is where we keep the not-so-smart ones. There, Goddard transformed the school into something it had never been before, a research facility. Goddard became the director of research, a Mm. new position at this school that he had made up, Mm, and began to push his career into the limelight by translating a revolutionary new concept in psychology. Please please don't. Please don't. Okay, hold on. Hold on. No. Because eventually, I feel like like I've known you long enough that I should be able to feel when the turn is coming. I feel Mm -hmm. like the turn is a coming. Because now I have dumb, you know, Dr. Catherine School for Dumb Girls, and I have the turn of the century, and I have this guy that's obsessed with intelligence, and he's about to do some research. And if there's one thing I know about old-timey doctors, it's they don't have a whole lot of morals about what you do research with, especially when it's with stupid people. So come on, lay it on me. What is he going to do to the stupid girls? He made the French Benet Simon intelligence test accessible to English speakers. This is This is one of the first... IQ test to hit America. Benet of Benet and Simon refers to Alfred Benet, a French psychologist who, in 1883, was using magnets and hypnosis to cure women of hysteria. Wait Does a minute. Does that sound familiar? Wait a minute. No, 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 no. That wasn't his thing. I know he started that guy. a trend. I know that guy. <laughs> We're friends. After, tr- after translating it, Goddard began spreading the test like wildfire. He circulated over 22,000 copies between the years in 1908 and 1918. And his passions only grew stronger. Goddard became obsessed with not only knowing who was smart and who was not, but he also was keen on coming up with new and creative ways to test human intelligence. And when it came to sussing out new and creative ways, mm. by the way, is <laughs> such a fun, <laughs> See, the first broad time, statement. The first time you let me down because I thought he was going to do something evil and he just started giving people fun internet IQ tests. But but now, now fun and creative, now I just... I, I, there's only so many ways you can test intelligence. I don't know how outside the box you can think with it. What is Dr. Goddard thinking? Don't worry, by the way. We're going to get back to that school of feeble-minded girls because uh, there's I, some... 
I hope so. That's a fun nugget. Because that is a Chekhov's gun if I've ever seen one. You can't just leave the school of feeble-minded girls like that. When it came to sussing out whether or not you were a smart cookie, Goddard thought he was hot shit. Uh, So like I've said, Goddard was obsessed with intelligence testing. By this point, though, he had very little idea of how to actually do it. At least, no original ideas of his own. He's translated the Binet Simon intelligence test, an early edition of the modern IQ test, but other than that, he had just started inventing labels for people who had lower scores. So if you've ever used the word moron recently, Goddard made that one up. Did Uh, did, Binet... Did did he lay claim to ignoramus? Oh, no, he did not. Oh, that's, a, that's a Cracker Barrel original then. Good. Good to know. <laughs> I love to find out uh, where some of the other ones come from. Benet coined the term retarded, though. So just, you know, make sure you're sending the royalty checks to him for that. Good, word. good, 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 good. So Goddard set to work distributing the deified Binet Simon test, freshly translated to the pristine American tongue, and while spreading its use, began testing methods of his own. Uh, Being at the forefront of the science in America, Goddard's presence was actually requested at Ellis Island. Before we get to that, though, I was hoping I could take a minute to talk about IQ tests. Not because there's a particular uh, douchebag who's been bragging about his or anything like that. Uh, Just trying to be strictly educational here. Very, very vague. Yes, yes. Uh, Now, now, let me tell you what I know about IQ tests. Stephen Hawking thinks they're bullshit, and I think he's a smart dude. So I'm going with IQ tests are bullshit. Let me tell you about that. The intelligence testing scale introduced by Binet Simon in 1905 would be better known as a predecessor to today's IQ test. IQ standing for intelligence quotient, which refers to your capacity to learn rather than how smart or knowledgeable you actually are. So you can have a remarkable capacity to learn and simultaneously have jack all motivation to work, study, or contribute anything valuable to society. Um, Anyway, Binet and Simon's test. The 1905 scale would measure how well you performed a task based on age. So, for example, if you solved a math problem with the efficiency of a 12-year-old while being 10 years old, then that means you'd have a score ratio of 1.2, which, when multiplied by 100, gives you an IQ score of 120. Makes sense? Okay, so if a 10-year-old solves the math problem at a 12-year-old level, that's good. But, like, if a 30-year-old solved it at a 12-year-old level, that'd be bad. (laughs) Right. Good to know. Examples... Examples of tasks performed in the 1905 scale depended on your age. So if you were two, you'd be asked to unwrap and eat a piece of candy. Uh, A five-year-old might be asked the difference between a fly and a butterfly. So one of my favorite things that I found when I was researching IQ tests uh, was an old paper copy of the Binet-Simon test, which had the following instructions. Number one, compare the numbers 3 and 59, then 6 and 159. Number two, copy the square. Number three, repeat the phrase, his name is John. He is a very good boy. Number four, whoa. count four pennies. Whoa, 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 Okay, what the fuck is that? The scale here is off the wall because that first one, I'm pretty sure, was like, I would have failed in a heartbeat. And then all I had to do is say, John is a good boy over and over, like a fucked up Jack Nicholson on The Shining thing. Like, one of these tasks is way easier than the other. And was the last one count four pennies? You told me how many pennies there were. That you, gave the, you gave the plot away. <laughs> Number five, Nathan, is patience. It literally just says the word patience in quotes. I don't... What, the, what the fuck? <laughs> is it spell the word patience? No, Nathan, wait, get, get ready for this. Those were used to test the intelligence of a five-year-old. Oh, fuck. What the fuck? I'm pretty sure he said... All right, so when you said find the square, did you mean, like, find the square root of the thing? Or was there just a square in the room somewhere and they had to point it out? (laughs) There was a square on the sheet of paper, and the test was to just do it again. Just draw it again. Oh, okay. That makes me seem a lot better because I was... I thought you said, like, do three and then 59 and then find the square, and I'm like, oh, I'm fucking done. I'm I'm an idiot. I am not going to do well on this test. (laughs) No, no, it's good to know that find the square was just draw a square. Okay, cool. No, 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 we're good now. We're good. But real quick, I mean, just to make so, 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 so we understand. Number one was compare the numbers three and 59 and then six and 159. Yeah, I don't know what that is. number two was just copy the square. All right. So can you spot the question, Nathan, that makes zero fucking sense to ask a five-year-old? Draw a square. Fine. Count the pennies. Sure. You got 10 fingers. Let's make it happen. Compare these four numbers, child who has no concept of multiplication or probably even addition or subtraction. What the fuck kind of answer are we looking for? Spencer, uh, as I can tell you, since you are not a parent, uh, that may be the one that stands out to you as the most ridiculous thing to ask a five-year-old. 
Uh, as a parent, no, 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 patience. Patience is the most ridiculous thing to be asking a five-year-old because those motherfuckers have zero attention span. They have no patience. It does not exist to them. Yeah, while we're here, if we're scoring five-year-olds, if we're scoring basically the population's intelligence based on how patient they were at age five, God willing that George Bush was trying to save the education system. Mm. Our standardized scores don't work. Everybody is retarded. Oh, no, we don't get it. We are all. They can't sit still when they're five. No, we are all. We are all doomed. Now let's get back to Ellis Island. Yeah, that was, kind of an interesting, that was kind of an interesting uh, an interesting one. Why, why are we going there? Are we only trying to let the smart immigrants in? Nathan, the Ellis Island Immigration Station opened for the first time on January 1st, 1892. Positioned north of Liberty Island in the upper New York Bay, the island was opened by the federal government to inspect incoming immigrants. Prior to that, New York State had its own center for immigration management, the Castle Garden Immigration Depot. Uh, within its first year... The Ellis Island Immigration Station processed over 450,000 immigrants, which is roughly a shit ton of people. That is, a, that is a large number of people. Also, Immigration Station sounds way better than the Castle Garden Depot. So they, they definitely <laughs> picked up on the marketing of, of immigration a lot better there. Look, I know which one I'm shopping at. Oh, yeah. People would either be accepted into the new world, turned away from it, or sometimes thrown in disease wards for treatment, or oh. more accurately, quarantine. In its 60 years of operation... Ellis Island's immigration station, I just like saying that, oh, yeah. saw millions and millions of immigrants passing through the U.S. of A. Now, according to one report, it's estimated that nearly 40% of all U.S. citizens owe their heritage to an ancestor that passed through Ellis Island. For, for a place that was only open for 60 years, that is fairly impressive. Yeah, yeah. Fairly By impressive. the way, 40%, I would guarantee you that some, if not all of those people, uh, have the energy to bitch and moan about Mexicans and Muslims, but... Mm. Breezing past but that. No, yeah, no, no, we're not. Yeah. Why Why do I have a distinct feeling you're about to make me feel bad about Ellis Island? But obviously, the island couldn't take anybody. I mean, in 1910, the eugenics movement had started to pick up some steam, and it would continue doing so until a little stinker over in Germany decided to ruin it by, you know, actually practicing it. Yeah, uh, one didn't, such he, side uh, effect. didn't he say that the, I, I'm pretty, the, the stinker, just to be clear, we're talking about Hitler, right? I'm not crazy. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Didn't he say that the great model for eugenics was like the state of California? Mm-hmm. In fact, we have a, uh, a future episode we might do about a particular man who is buried next door to my college. Oh, who, uh, kicked off eugenics in America. Yeah. Eugenics, is, eugenics is, fucking, is fucking idiotic, people. Mm-hmm. I feel like the, for the I feel like that's one of the I feel like eugenics is like the Ron Paul of science. Like he starts talking and like twenty percent of it, like yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you, and then it just goes off the fucking rails, and <laughs> and and it just devolves into nonsense and and bullshit and and just goddamn it. Like like I'm with you for some of it. Like okay, you sound like you know what you're talking about, and then I don't you, master races and race breeding and bullshit. One such side effect of this movement was a need to make sure that stupid people weren't breeding, much less living in America. So naturally, they invited everybody's favorite idiot detector, Henry Goddard, to come uh, scope out the immigrants. <laughs> Wait, to be clear, the guy who, who had it had been noted had no new ideas on how to test. He just translated a test. Oh, but don't worry, Nathan. Those new ideas are coming. He's been oh. experimenting in his cross-country tours. God. He worked on the island for nearly two years, determining which immigrants were too stupid to come aboard our nation, which strangely was called Land of the Free, because Land of the Free, unless you're stupid, black, Chinese, Irish, or stupid, was uh, just kind of too long. Did they just the cut testing... that part off of the Statue of Liberty? The bring me, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses, unless they're idiots? Is that it was just too long, too many characters? <laughs> if you look closely, it's been sanded off. Uh, good, good the, the testing process wasn't all by the book, though, because after enough time, Goddard began to realize that he didn't need pen and paper, or no. rules for that matter, oh, to determine someone's intelligence. Oh, God, no. He can't just look at a person and be like, you're an idiot. No, no, no. Nathan, it's funny you should say that, because he could. No. In no. some instances, a few <laughs> questions were all that were necessary to pick out an idiot, moron, or otherwise feeble-minded person. One of his favorite methods of determining whether or not you were feeble-minded was to ask which team had won the World Series that year. What the fuck? Come on! Are you kidding me? <laughs> now, Nathan, would you... Say you're an immigrant. Say say you're say you're an immigrant. Say you're me! The World Series happened three weeks ago. I like sports. I could barely tell you who won the World Series. Say you're from Russia and you just get off the boat and Henry Goddard comes up and he's like, All right, asshole. 
who won the World Series. I can't, what, I can't have a Czechoslovakian woman who's never seen a baseball before and ask her who won the World Series. <laughs> that seems like an unfair test, good sir. If they didn't know, which was shockingly lots and lots of people, they were put right back on the boat home. Oh my god. So the only people we let in the country were like, what, Dodgers fans? Like, that was it? Like, that was mm-hmm. our just standard? Like, who's paying attention? <laughs> that, that was sort of the Ellis Island experience from 1910 to 1912. You got off a boat, Henry Goddard asked you about sports, called you retarded, and then sent you back across the ocean. I mean, because that, 1912 was that, a horrible year to not know who the Red Sox were. That kind of feels like any message board on any sports column that's been written in the last 10 years, though. <laughs> With Goddard on staff at Ellis Island, deportation rates were increased fivefold. That's fantastic. So, so we've always been awful to immigrants. It's not it's not new, is what you're telling me. Uh-huh. Okay. On top of that, in line with the era's horrible culture, 80% of Jews, Hungarians, Russians, and Italians were found to be feeble-minded by Goddard and Weird. summarily shoved back on the boat to Europe. So if you looked just a little bit Jewish, Goddard was like, mm, no need. Get see, him back. He's see, stupid. We, we, I feel like we've devolved, because I feel like back then... We had an even purer form of, of hating people because we, we could distinguish between white people we didn't like. Now it's just, <laughs> eh, as long as you're white, you're in. Get in here, buddy. Back then, they were very specific with how white you had to be. You had to be this kind of white or you were out. In the interest of being completely honest, at least he was responsible for the first American law to mandate special education. Oh, no, my, my mistake. I thought I was done saying all the horrible shit he did. Goddard was one of many would-be eugenicists who had a fascination with one particular case, the Kalakak family. It began with a woman named Emma Wolverton, an older woman at Goddard's own Vineland Institution for the Mentally Disabled, or, uh, you know, as we like to call it, the School for Feeble-Minded Ladies. Woo! Emma was, a, <laughs> Emma was a feeble-minded girl, and was in, uh, and, and <clears throat> Emma was a feeble-minded girl, and when investigating her genealogy, Goddard found, quote, Something incredible and a surprising moral tale. Oh, God. He set to work on a book telling us the story of the Calicax. Goddard's book takes us back to the Revolutionary War, to a soldier named Martin Calicac. Martin was a devout Quaker with a beautiful, faithful Quaker wife. Martin the Quaker had many wonderful Quaker children with his dutiful Quaker wife. Those children and their children's children became some of the healthiest, most dutiful children to bless this green earth. But if you could believe it, there is more to this moral tale, Nathan. See, what, what more than this little house on the prairie style, like, yay, t- I, 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 I can't imagine. Martin also had an affair with a nameless, feeble-minded woman. Oh, God. That woman gave birth to a terrible boy named, quote, Old Horror. What? <laughs> Old Horror? Like he's a fucking lich king. None of that makes sense. What? He, he's not an eldritch beast coming out. You can't name him Old Horror. So Old Horror was born, and from his loins came hundreds of society's worst feeble-minded citizens. Oh, dear Christ. Goddard deduced that many local families shared a common ancestry with this Martin Kalakak, which, by the way, is a pseudonym made up from two Greek words for good and bad. Wait, wait, wait. wait. And those... Uh huh. So many of them, many of them had the common answer. Was this guy just fucking everybody, or was it just he fucked the good Quaker woman and then he fucked the dirty whore, and the good Quaker woman made good Quaker babies and the dirty whore made dirty whore babies? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So he had six great Quaker children, seven, excuse me, seven uh-huh. great Quaker children, uh-huh. and then the the whore birthed old horror, who is literally drawn as a demon in the image I'm looking at. Okay. Uh, and okay. And old horror just fucked around, fucked around Maine and established all of the worst people in society. Okay, he's cool. their common ancestor. Good, good to good, good to know. We have a Crimson King style situation. Oh my, okay, fantastic. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that Mr. Goddard was making a point about good, good people breeding with good people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here's 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 an interesting question for our dead doctor. Why can't we just assume that it was the good Quaker woman that was good? And maybe maybe other dude was just an asshole because 
she's the constant that produced the good kids. He's 50-50. He produced six good kids with her, and then the first time he goes off and gets some strange, he makes it a horror baby. Yeah, yeah. He literally births an eldritch demon. He birthed Got her an deduced. Ex- I'm kind of assuming that it's the other goodly Quaker woman's loins that are producing good babies. And those who were born from this feeble-minded girl were all riddled with disease, malformation, and mental deficiencies, while those born from the Quakeress were healthy. This was, of course, not nearly as simple as Goddard wanted to make it. That's and in some about cases, to say. the well, weird thing is he knew it. He knew he was bullshitting in some cases. In his book, Goddard would include pictures of these feeble-minded calicacs that still littered his fine city, as posted. Uh, you can find pictures of them on our website, but... If you look at the photos, you will notice something a little weird about them, and that is that the the eyes and the mouths look especially off. And it's because if you if you read from Stephen Gould, who's a uh, a modern paleontologist, he asserted uh, that Goddard or someone working for him had doctored the photos of these children to make them appear more wild. Now, photo manipulation in 1912 wasn't exactly a huge thing, so somebody who doesn't, like, you know, look at Reddit and see a Photoshop picture every single day uh, would believe this shit. So, on top of the obvious fact-twisting, there's also the fact that he's asserting that stupidity is genetic. Now, in actuality, the people that are on the feeble-minded side of the Kalakak family probably suffered from undiagnosed fetal alcohol syndrome, Something that you kind of get when you're born into poor families in the 1800s in an age without doctors who are saying, Mary, put the fucking sauce down. It's killing your baby. I feel like that was anyone born before 1962. Now, Goddard came to realize later in life that his book may have been a huge misjudgment and attempted to convince the public that it wasn't a good explanation of how mental deficiency or genetics actually worked. Uh, but the damage was done. I was about the to books, say, yeah, nice. Try, try and put the box back, lid back on that one, Pandora. Not happening. The book sold about as well as his translated Simon Binet intelligence test, and Goddard's contribution to eugenics were made on a huge scale. At first, Goddard intended for the popularity of his book to raise public funding for institutions like his, where the mentally challenged could be treated. Uh, but instead, the public was way more fond of the easier, less cool yeah. method of just sterilizing anybody God that was scored as a moron. Damn it, God! Da- you make me feel bad. He, God, he didn't want. He just kind of wanted to raise awareness. He actually kind of wanted to treat stupid people, even though he had the dumbest stupid person test ever. Who won the World Series this year? He, but <laughs> what? We're just awful people, and if you give us an excuse to say someone's dumber than us, we're gonna take it and run with it. Goddard died on June eighteenth, nineteen fifty-seven, in Santa Barbara, California. He was 90 years old, but I thank the fact that he lived long enough to see the eugenics revolution shamelessly put itself down in America, you know, after we kind of saw it murder millions and millions of Jews. Yeah, I was about to say, after we gave Hitler a roadmap for how to, ass- you know, you know, eliminate a species. Good work. Uh, despite his assertion that his book may have been inaccurate, Goddard was still said to be confused when people said that his works were harmful, even when it was directly said that immigrants were an immoral and unhealthy addition to our country in his books. I, I just love that. Like some, so you know you you fucked up, right? But but I was just trying my best. I just asked people who won the World Series and then sent them away from America. What are you talking about? This is just, I just said hateful inflammatory things and threw it into a fu- threw them into a fire. I didn't know bad shit would happen. I would like to thank my sources for this week's post. Uh, you can find them at uh, cockandbullblog.wordpress.org.com Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, next week. Eugenic sucks.